Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and implications of emerging science and technology. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and I'll be your host. It's now October, and time again to explore the latest in life extension science. So let's get started. Remember, to find out more about any of these topics, you can visit lifespan.io forward slash roundup. Some big news, we've launched a crowdfunding campaign in support of MitoSense, a project of the Sens Research Foundation. This time, the team of MitoSense is going to investigate the possibility of rescuing mitochondrial function in a living organism by moving the mitochondrial genes to the nucleus in transgenic mice. Please support the campaign with a donation, and don't forget to tell your friends to do the same. If the study is successful, it could open the door to controlling mitochondrial function in humans. On September 19th, LEAF board member Elena Malova took part in the Moscow Biohacking Conference by talking about the motivation for a radically extended lifespan. She reminded the audience that acting on the desire for a long life ultimately means taking personal responsibility for sustainable development and addressing global issues such as population aging, drug resistance, and pollution before they become threats. New episodes of the Life Extend show have been released on our YouTube channel, Topics include the nine basic hallmarks of aging and a history of life extension. We've shared quite a few videos from the Ending Age-Related Diseases Conference in September, so if you couldn't attend, this is your chance to see what you've missed. Posted videos feature Morgan Levine of the Yale School of Medicine, Dr. Michael West of Ajax Therapeutics, Reason of Repair Biotechnologies, Dr. Kelsey Moody of i Therapeutics, and more. New interviews also recently went live on our website. One with Dr. Jay Oshansky of the University of Illinois was recorded at the International Perspectives in Geroscience Conference in Israel. It was at this event that Leaf's Elena Malova spoke with Dr. Nir Barzilai of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Here are some of Dr. Barzilai's thoughts on the conference. This is the international perspective of Geroscience that was held in Israel on, on September 4th and 5th. So there were two talks about mitochondria and how mitochondria is involved in aging. And I think the thing that people don't realize that the mitochondria, be, be, beside its role in energy production, it has its old genome, and its genome contains proteins or small peptides that are secreted and have role in health and diseases. There are even genetic mutations in some of uh, those peptides that change their outcome and People with those mutations have lots of uh, changes in their health uh, outcomes, including uh, cognition, diabetes, uh, uh, and, and other things. So I think a whole field of mitochondrial-derived peptide is really something that we should pay attention to. The second talk of mitochondria that is not yet related to aging was by uh, Minovia, which is an Israeli company, and Natalie Ochayon, uh, presented uh, results of treating people, uh, children who have severe uh, mitochondrial deficiency by taking their stem cell and putting mitochondria from their mothers into the stem cell, letting those stem cells back, and what happens, the mitochondria populate the rest of the cells in their body with uh, an absolutely great outcome from those children. So this is in children, but the idea that maybe we can replace uh, defective mitochondria or add mitochondria to elderly is really very attractive. Uh, the second thing I think is uh, maybe a little bit more futuristic, but was David Sinclair's talk, where he said, you know, we have this digital uh, uh, information that is uh, the sequence of our t DNA, uh, and we get uh, uh, scratches on our CD, uh, and there's a whole analog part of the DNA because of methylation and other epigenetic that makes it work 
better or less or, or something, and how do we fix this uh, information malfunction? And he showed that by uh, giving three of the Yamamoto factors, uh, you can kind of reverse aging in certain cells. He, he shows in neurons in crush of an optic nerve. And I, I think this is kind of the first um, example of how we can reverse even some of the aging in the future. We also have some featured content with Dr. David Sinclair of Harvard Medical School, who read excerpts from his brand new book, Lifespan, Why We Age, and Why We Don't Have To. Here's a sample of that. If you haven't seen the book, it's, I tried to do something better and different than anything that's come before in science writing. I hope you enjoy it all, and I'd love to read a, a few passages for you right now. And the first part is in the introduction to the book. Ever since I can remember, I have wanted to understand why we grow old. But finding the source of a complex biological process is like searching for the spring at the source of a river. It's not easy. On my quest, I've wound my way left and right and had days when I wanted to give up, but I've persevered. Along the way, I've seen a lot of tributaries, but I've also found what may be the spring. In the coming pages, I will present a new idea about why aging evolved and how it fits into what I call the information theory of aging. I'll also tell you why I have come to see aging as a disease, the most common disease, one that is not one that not only can be treated, but should be aggressively treated. That's part one. In part two, I will introduce you to the steps that can be taken right now and new therapies in development that may slow, stop, and even reverse aging, bringing an end to aging as we know it. And yes, I fully recognize the implications of the words bringing an end to aging as we know it. So in part three, I will acknowledge the many possible futures these actions could create and propose a path to a future that we can look forward to, a world in which the way we can get to an increased lifespan is through an ever rising health span, the portion of our lives spent without disease or disability. Now there are plenty of people who will tell you it's a fairy tale, closer to the work of H.G. Wells than those of C.R. Darwin. And some of them are very smart. A few are even people who understand human biology quite well and whom I respect. Those people will tell you that our modern lifestyles have cursed us with shortening lifespans. They'll say you're unlikely to see a hundred years and that your children are unlikely to get to the century mark too. They'll say that they've looked at all the science and done the projections and it sure doesn't seem likely that your grandchildren will get to their hundredth birthdays either. And they'll say that if you do get to 100, you'll probably, you won't get there healthy, and you definitely won't get there for very long. And if they grant you that people will live longer, they'll tell you that it's the worst thing for this planet. Humans are the enemy. They've got good evidence for all of this, the entire history of humanity, in fact. Sure, little by little, millennia by millennia, we've been adding years to the average human life, they will say. Most of us didn't get till get to 40 and then we did. Most of us didn't get to 50 and then we did. Most of us didn't get to 60 and then we did. By and large, these increases in life expectancy came as more of us gained access to stable food sources and clean water. And largely the average was pushed upwards from the bottom. Death during infancy and childhood fell and life expectancy rose. This is the simple math of human mortality. But although the average kept moving up, the limit did not. As long as we've been recording history, we have known of people who have reached their hundredth year and who might have lived a few years beyond that mark, but very few reach 110 and almost no one reaches 115. Our planet has been home to more than 100 billion humans so far, and we know of just one, Jeanne Calmen of France, who ostensibly lived past the age of 120. Most scientists believe she died in 1997 at the age of 122 although it's possible that her daughter replaced her to avoid paying taxes. Whether or not she actually made it to that age really doesn't matter. Others have come within a few years of that age, but most of us, 99.9% .9 of us to be precise, are dead before 100. So it certainly makes sense when people say that we might continue to chip away at the average, 
but we're not likely to move the limit. They say it's easier to extend the maximum lifespan of mice or of dogs, but we humans are different. We simply live too long already. They are wrong. There's also a difference between extending life and prolonging vitality. We're capable of both, but simply keeping people alive decades after their lives have become defined by pain, disease, frailty, and immobility is no virtue. Prolonged vitality, meaning not just more years of life, but more active, healthy, and happy ones is coming. And it's coming sooner than most people expect. By the time the children who are born today have reached middle age, John Calment may not even be on the list of top 100 oldest people of all time. And by the turn of the next century, a person who is 122 on the day of his or her death may be said to have lived a full, though not a particularly long life. 120 years might not be an outlier, but an ex expectation. So much so that we won't even call it longevity. We'll just simply call it life. And we'll look back at, with sadness on a time in our history in which it was not so. So what is the upward limit? I don't think there is one. Many of my colleagues agree. There is no biological law that says we must age. And those who say there is, they don't know what they're talking about. We're probably still a long way off from a world in which death is a rarity, but we're not far from pushing it even farther into the future. All of this is in fact inevitable. Prolonged healthy lifespans are in sight. Yes, the entire history of humanity suggests otherwise, but the science of lifespan extension in this particular century says that the previous dead ends are poor guides. It takes radical thinking to even begin to approach what this will mean for our species. Nothing in our billions of years of evolution has prepared us for this, which is why it's so easy, even alluring, to say that it just simply cannot be done. But that's what people thought about human flight up until the moment that a couple of people did it. So today the Wright brothers are back in their workshop, having successfully flown their gliders down the sand dunes of Kitty Hawk. The world is about to change. And just as was the case in the days leading up to December 17, 1903, the majority of humanity is oblivious. There was simply no context with which to construct the idea of controlled powered flight back then. So the idea was fanciful, magical, the stuff of speculative fiction, then lift off and nothing was ever the same. We are at another point of historical inflection. What hitherto seemed magical will become real. It is a time in which humanity will redefine what is possible, a time of ending the inevitable. Indeed, it is, a, it is a time in which we will redefine what it means to be human. For this is not just the start of a revolution, it is the start of an evolution. And now for our research roundup. In silico medicine has achieved a world first by successfully designing, synthesizing, and validating a new drug from the ground up in just 46 days. It achieved this impressive feat using artificial intelligence. This is the first time that AI has been used to successfully create a new drug, and it took record time compared to traditional methods. The new drug works by blocking the activity of a gene implicated in fibrosis. Fibrosis currently has no cure, and as such, a drug that could effectively treat it would address an urgent unmet medical need. Insilico has recently raised $37 million to further develop its pipeline and commercialize some of its technology. Age-related changes to the signal sent and received by our cells traveling in the bloodstream are one of the hallmarks of aging. A team of researchers, including doctors Irina and Michael Conboy, has published the results of a new study suggesting that rejuvenation might be achieved by the calibration of these signals found in the blood. A joint study by researchers at the National Institutes of Health and the University of Maryland has revealed a previously undocumented function of the telomerase enzyme. The study, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, has shown that telomerase can be reactivated in healthy adult cells during the course of cell aging. The researchers think that this is a protective mechanism to reduce the chance of DNA damage, which would increase cancer risk due to genomic instability. The new discovery significantly changes our understanding of telomerase and how it relates to aging. A small clinical trial, which was conducted by a team of researchers led by Dr. Greg Fahey, 
has shown for the first time in humans that reversing biological age may be possible. The researchers spent a year running the thymus regeneration, immunorestoration, and insulin mitigation trial, or TRIM, in which the participants were given a combination of growth hormone and two types of diabetes medications. Their biological ages were reduced by an average of 2.5 years, as measured by an epigenetic clock. Researchers from North Carolina State University have demonstrated that exosomes, harvested from human skin cells, can repair sun-damaged skin cells in mice. The therapy also appears to be more effective than retinol in stem cell treatment, and best of all, delivery of the therapy is needle-free. Researchers at the Buck Institute, including Dr. Judy Campisi, have published a new study that shows, for the first time, that senescent cells are associated with age-related blood clots. In the new study, the researchers identified a total of 343 proteins present in the senescence-associated secretory phenotype produced by senescent skin cells, with 44 of them associated with blood clotting. To find out more about the topics mentioned in our research roundup, visit lifespan.io forward slash roundup. There are multiple great events coming up in October. On October 15th and 16th, Targeting Metabesity 2019 will take place at the Carnegie Institution for Science in Washington, D.C. By Metabesity, the organizers of the event mean the constellation of chronic diseases and complications of senescence. In other words, aging. This two-day conference will feature many of the brightest stars of science, including Dr. Nir Barzilai, Laura Deming, Dr. Vadim Gladyshev, Dr. Joan Manick, and many more. Another interesting event, Longing for Longevity, will take place on October 22nd and 23rd in Montreal. The event will feature speakers such as Dr. David Sinclair, and it's free to attend, so if you're around, it's surely worth a visit. On October 25th, LEAF board member Elena Malova will participate in the Biomedical Forum Open Bio in Russia, where she will give a talk on investment opportunities and will be a co-moderator of a session on rejuvenation biotechnologies. Billing itself as the most powerful inspiration and information for staying alive, the upcoming RADFEST conference will discuss multiple facets of the longevity industry. Speakers include Dr. Aubrey de Grey, Dr. Greg Fahey, Liz Parrish, and many more. I will be traveling to Boston from October 11th through 13th to participate in the Global Community Bio Summit at the MIT Media Lab. The goal of this event is to provide a space for the global community of DIY biologists and biohackers to convene, plan, build fellowship, and continue to evolve. If you'll be around for this event, I look forward to seeing you there. That's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against age-related disease. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about it on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Once again, I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and on behalf of the team at LEAF, we wanted to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Mm -hmm.